Chris, uh, take us to a different space. Thank you very much. Hopefully you can hear me. Um, so my name is Chris Royal. I'm the Director of Sustainability at Transport for New South Wales. So I'm hoping to give you a bit of an insight into how, I guess, state government um, operates from a decarbonisation perspective and certainly give some insights into um, what we can do from a policy and strategy perspective and, and also on the ground actions. So I'm just firstly going to talk about our approach to sustainability and net zero more broadly. Then I'm going to go into our four pillars of transport decarbonisation, uh, then into how to drive reductions in carbon through the business cases, um, and then into how sustainable procurement practices will drive reductions in carbon overall. So as we all know, sustainability in Australia isn't really a highly regulated or legislated discipline. So we're very much reliant on uh, government policy and strategy to drive sustainable and decarbonisation outcomes. I'm not going to go into these, but just to let you know, in New South Wales, we do have a number of policy levers that we can rely on. So focused on uh, climate change, mitigation and adaptation. And we also have some both short and long term strategies that exist. The most notable being from a transport perspective, the future transport, um, uh, which is a 40 year timeline on, uh, in, on develop, uh, transport development. So um, in, with that in mind, um, we, Transport for New South Wales has just produced its first ever transport sustainability report and transport sustainability plan. That was released at the end of last year. The, the sustainability report is almost a backwards look on what we have achieved and what we need to do better. It was meant to be a transparent or it is a very transparent avoiding greenwash report um, uh, on, on what on our basically our performance. And then the plan is really our strategic, our forward look. What are we going to focus on? Uh, what are our strategic goals? Um, and what are our initiatives? And it's quite clear to us, we basically set five initiatives for the next couple of years. And it's quite clear to us that the primary drivers from industry um, are around net zero and green transport and around implementing a circular economy. So they really featured very highly in our sustainability plan for transport for New South Wales. Now, in terms of decarbonisation and our approach to net zero, we've really broken it down into four pillars of decarbonisation. The first one is around our operational emissions, so getting our house in order, um, and that's around electri electrification and use of renewable energy, and also with demand reduction and energy efficiency. The second pillar is around our enabled emissions or user emissions, so obviously all the users that use the road and rail networks, um, and um, essentially what we can do in that space to decarbonise, that makes up 90 plus percent of transport sectoral emissions, um, and really, we're trying to drive uptake of EVs um, and development of low carbon technologies to support heavy freight and heavy vehicles. The third column is around construction emissions. Um, and how are we addressing that? Well, predominantly through net zero procurement, but also looking at significant decarbonisation of our materials and our supply chains um, and a number of other initiatives. And, and then there's also our investment decision making as the fourth pillar. And that's around how we prioritize our investments to support low carbon outcomes and to ensure that any um, offsetting that we do need to purchase has, has a high level of veracity and validity. So I'm just gonna go into a bit more detail. So in operational sense from transport perspective, it makes up about 6% of transport sectoral emissions. But notwithstanding that, we Transport for New South Wales is a top 10 electricity user in New South Wales and a top 100 electricity or energy consumer in Australia. So although it's only 6%, it's still an enormous amount. And what we've done is we've basically very recently set a net zero in transport operations target that will be formally announced in about two weeks time through the update to the future transport strategy. We're on track for about a 75% reduction by 2035. Now that's basically been led by the transition of our entire electrified rail network to, uh, to renewable um, energy, renewable electricity. That happened in, on July the 1st, 2021. We're now running all of our electrified rail network bar small components of light rail on 100% renewable energy. Uh, so that's decarbonised us immediately overnight by about 45 to 50% of our pre-2021 emissions, or pre-2019 emissions, I should say. Um, we're also doing a lot of work to electrify our um, a bus network called the Zero Emission Bus Programme. That's about 8,000 uh, diesel buses that we currently have. We're trying to electrify those. 
And we're really trying to demonstrate consistency with the New South Wales climate change policy framework. And of course, the 2016 Paris Agreement. That's really a key uh, of key importance that we link to that and demonstrate those kind of alignment to the science-based targets. How are we going to achieve that uh, going forward? Um, so uh, procuring 100% of renewable energy for all electricity, not just our rail networks, electrification of our buses, our ferry fleets, our corporate vehicles and our non-passenger vehicle fleets, improving our energy efficiency and reducing our energy demand through a number of projects we have ongoing, looking at strategic rail electrification, so identifying areas in our regional areas that aren't currently electrified using diesel trains, and looking at strategic rail electrification and basically weighing up not diesel versus electrification, weighing up the use of hydrogen versus the use of um, electrification. Um, obviously looking at the optimal use of green hydrogen where it's where it's got that niche application, um, limiting the use of accredited carbon offsets. That's, that's a key factor. We really want to limit carbon offsetting um, and then really having very robust greenhouse gas tracking and reporting systems. The second pillar about transport construction. So first pillar operations, sex pillar, uh, second pillar transport construction. Now, Transport for New South Wales has a $77 billion forward pipeline over the next few years. So we're an enormous um, consumer of materials. And I believe we are um, the largest consumer of materials in New South Wales and probably one of the largest in Australia, if not the largest. So anything we do has enormous influence on the supply chains and, and practices beyond transport and beyond transport for New South Wales. So there's really a lot of um, strategic, there's really a lot of leadership desire to take the lead at Transport for New South Wales and to have that influence. And the progress so far is we've just recently undertaken our, our first steps into our sustainable procurement in infrastructure industry engagement initiative, which is basically the biggest um, re reception that we've ever had for any industry event at Transport for New South Wales. And it's trying to drive um, decarbonisation and circular, circular economy outcomes in our procurement practices, recognising that that's probably one of the biggest levers we have to pull. And the other component of that um, that is underway now is we want, we're also developing a very robust inventory of our scope three emissions across all of our projects and programmes, which is a very complex pro uh, process to do, given the enormity of the capital investment and, in, and, the, and the hundreds and thousands of projects that we're developing um, at, at any point in time. So how are we going to achieve that net zero in construction? Well, firstly, we do we are thinking at the moment about developing an aspirational construction emissions target similar to um, Highways England or National Highways in the UK who set actually a 2040 construction emissions target. We are now thinking we will, will need to do the same sort of thing. We haven't worked out the details quite yet, but certainly we're on the pathway to that. We also believe we need to develop a net zero policy to give clarity to all of our decision makers and to clarity to industry on the direction of transport for New South Wales. And we're also looking to develop a net zero roadmap. So very much aligned to that, um, to international papers and standards that exist. So there's that UK national highways plan, um, the, uh, the PAS standard 2080, um, the ISC report that came out earlier this year, the IPA report, the FACTS um, plan, all of these have really outlined decarbonisation in, in infrastructure and, and to a certain degree in transport. And we're looking to align to those and really build out how we achieve that in Transport for New South Wales. We also want to um, take lessons learned from elsewhere. So we've talked about Barangaroo today. We've talked about um, other pro significant projects that are happening. Um, we really want to take away those lessons learned from some of those big infrastructure projects. And some of the biggest ones in New South Wales are the Sydney Metro programs. And they've, they're they looking to embed net zero procurement and net zero construction in a lot of their procurement packages. So we're looking to learn from that at the Transport for New South Wales cluster scale. We're also to, looking to develop not just the high, high level targets. We have the 2050 governmental target the possibly um, targets internally for, for net zero, but also subsidiary targets. We recognise it's the trajectory in decarbonisation, not the end outcome that's important. And so we're looking to develop subsidiary net zero targets or benchmarks for programmes or projects um, and also for key materials. So it may be that we set targets for concrete, for um, steel, for asphalt, for all of our big supply chain consumptions recognizing the enormous difficulty of doing that or almost impossibility in certain material uh, frameworks. And then obviously in employing carbon design, reporting and management tools. The third pathway is around asset uh, investment decisions. And this is probably the one that we believe 
um, is the biggest lever to pull. And really um, what it means is that, so the opportunities for carbon reduction are more significant at earlier stages of infrastructure and asset uh, delivery and design as, as we've discussed, but it, uh, embedding appropriate externality values. And we all taught this in um, Environmental Economics 101 is that we don't internalize our environmental externalities. And it's, and it's seen as probably the most economically efficient way um, to, to in, enable decarbonization. Um, and at the moment, we do apply certain ex economic externality values into our business cases, uh, New, South, uh, New South Wales Treasury level and in Transport for New South Wales projects. We, we have externality values for delays, for safety, for noise, for air quality, for amenity. But the carbon value that we use is, is fairly low by international standards, or well, very low by international standards. And so what we've been looking to do is to work with Treasury and taking Treasury's lead, um, to really take a completely different international approach to how we value carbon. In the absence of, I guess, federal leadership in this space, um, what can we do? Uh, what can we do to sort of really leverage um, significant decarbonisation outcomes through e um, efficient ex ex um, economic externalities? And it's very, very promising. I can't give anything away because it's kind of commercial incompetence at the moment. But New South Wales Treasury has just released its first ever draft um, uh, government uh, guide to cost benefit analysis. So it's not its first ever, it's the update to it. Um, and it's got some incredible new um, uh, outcomes in that, um, in that draft document I've seen. Again, I can't go into the details, but essentially there's three ways of valuing carbon generally. There's the um, target consistent marginal abatement cost approach. There's the, um, there's the market-based approach similar to the EU emissions trading scheme. Um, and then there's also the social or the damage cost. And, and Treasury have been looking at all of these opportunities, trying to align with international best practice. And we're looking to leverage what Treasury is offering to and, and embed that at transport to really leverage um, decarbonisation outcomes uh, in the best possible way. So lots of exciting stuff going on. Um, watch this space. And we think it's going to be a game changer for transport and infrastructure going forward in New South Wales and hopefully more broadly. And then the fourth and final uh, column is around enabled emissions. So that's those user emissions of our networks. And as I said, that makes up um, a, the, the vast majority of our emissions from a transport sector perspective. Um, acknowledging that the transport cluster is projected to increase its emissions profile, uh, both in absolute terms and relative terms until 2030. So this is really, really important to decarbonize these enabled emissions. And we really want to take a lead on this because we recognize this is as much as we can't control it, we have a massive influencing uh, space. So what can we do? Well, we, we've got the EV strategy in New South Wales, EV strategy, and we have a transport for New South Wales EV strategic approach. And that's around administering um, stamp duty exemptions, um, achieving the EV target, um, advoc advocating and, and improving access to charging infrastructure and so on and so forth. Um, we have a net zero freight strategy or policy that's under development now looking at how we decarbonise freight and, and heavy vehicles. We have a hydrogen strategy at New South Wales government level and also at subsidiary level at Transport for New South Wales, looking at logistics and, and research and trials. And then also benchmarking and standards. So working with um, uh, other government departments to leverage uh, technology, energy and emissions benchmarking, um, design standards and so on and so forth. So Chris, I'm um, getting a little bit nervous about our timing now. Um, okay, I'll finish up. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll, I'll finish up. I've got two more slides to go. I've got one more slide that I'll talk to you and then I don't need to skip through the rest because everyone will be aware about it anyway. So the other, the other last but not least um, is decarbonisation through procurement. So I mentioned it briefly earlier. We need to transition away from a linear consumption model to a circular development model. Um, and what does that look like? Well, we have our sustainable procurement and infrastructure initiative, which is very much looking at decarbonisation through and circularity in procurement. Um, and we're looking to leverage a number of digital and material platforms to really enable the use of recycled materials in all of our uh, material supply chains. We've got thousands and thousands of different specs of materials that we use across transport. We're looking at providing easy to access, clear information for contractors so that you know the minimum and maximum allowable percentages of recycled or lower embodied emissions materials in each of our design standards. Um, and a number of other design pathways that will help 
contractors, consultants, and uh, delivery partners. So it's really about enabling and helping others to achieve the outcomes that we're looking to achieve. Um, I don't need to go through this. This is really we, just to say that we have a number of sustainability ratings pathways that we use that also feature decarbonisation, but most people would be aware of ISC and the Green Building Council. Um, but we also have our internal sustainable design guidelines and baseline requirements, which we're rolling out shortly. We'll have to call um, that's it. Me, <laughs> yeah, no worries. All right, it's pretty much it for me. Sorry, um, just to um, say... Can I, can I just... Sorry, I really think we have to wrap up, uh, but I do want to ask you a question, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, the, you've, this process is again, and it's fantastic to see such leadership from New South Wales yet again. Um, it really invites the whole question about you know, vertical integration decision making. This is a highly vertically integrated process. Do you, do you see that changing the way um, you know, the, the, the infrastructure is uh, procured and the contracting and the contract terms and greater flexibility for sharing risk and engaging everybody through the length of the process? And Yes, I think so, yeah. Um, I mean, the, the one thing that we've seen, I think the, the major thing I've seen is a change in culture in both the organisation and, I guess, politically. Um, and we now have that leadership to, to really drive forward the significant change that's required. I think that I've, I've seen that evolve over the last 10 years or so. Yeah. And um, that's really the, the biggest, I guess, influence, in fact, I've, I've seen um, is, is that leadership um, that accountability and that willingness to take take the risks and acknowledge that it's going to cost more in the short term, but there'll be benefits to society in the long term. Yeah. Well, given we're looking at business cases with carbon in there as a, one of the criteria, not just dollars and, and uh, so forth. Um, uh, Will, I, I know uh, we were talking and you were talking about a, a former or a friend of yours who used to be an actuary who's... Um, doing bringing whole of life carbon accounting into um, building valuations that sort of a, a, another set of the same context would you like to just touch on that briefly we have got a couple of minutes left yeah sure i think i mean there's a there's often a pushback still at least over here from clients where they expect that a lower carbon solution is going to cost more money um but the work that my friend's been doing is uh, insurance companies have predictions for the the cost of carbon into the future um, because they're all interested in working out what their assets are going to be worth um, 10, 20, 30 years from now. And to give you a feel for what those predictions look like, they, they range from 200 to 1,000 Aussie dollars per tonne of carbon 20 or 30 years from now. So really sort of big, big money. And that will effectively be the cost of offsetting, um, which will therefore also be the cost of, or the cost saving presented through lower carbon design, which means that buildings being built today will be these sort of material banks worth hundreds of thousands of dollars in the future um, by way of saving on carbon. So there's a really interesting sort of financial model that he's trying to work up on how you could actually value what you build today based on its sort of sellability in carbon terms 20, 30 years down the line, which I don't think people are fully sort of cognizant of yet, but I think will become quite big, quite big talk. And that's going to drive circularity thinking um, and designing for reuse, definitely. Fascinating. Um, I have to say, I, I've been trying to keep track of the chat a bit, and it's, it, it's a very high value, high quality chat in this, uh, this forum, I have to say. There's a lot, it's, there's a lot of quality information that you know, we keep all this, don't we, Monica? We, we, um, because there's, there's been some quite interesting debates and, and a lot of kind of links to, to um, you know, other data and information. It's, uh, it, uh, you know, one almost wishes when there was, had two heads could follow it fully, but anyway, that's not the case. Uh, one, of the, one of them I picked up, and it's a favourite topic of mine, so I'm going to return to it if I can within a couple of minutes we've got left. Um, I think it was um, Rick and Jeremy with Will um, sort of uh, tossing around um, the, the issue of accuracy of, of reporting, and um, I think it might have been um, Alistair maybe who mentioned about hybrid methods and so forth. And, and you, you made an interesting uh, summary to that, Will, in terms of... Um, all doing it the same way rather than getting too caught up about accuracy at this point. Would you like to elaborate on that, please? Well, I'd just say, I mean, it, I'd say that the, the level of urgency that needs to be had means that we need to work on reducing carbon. That, that you know, the calculating carbon is not the important thing here. Reducing carbon is more important. And, and I think people get lost in debate about methodologies and precision of numbers. On, uh, and that will improve over time. Um, what's important today is that we are calculating on everything we work on. We, we use the same methodologies as each other so that we can compare 
options and we can compare what others are achieving and we can say in ballpark terms how, how effective we're being at reducing that carbon. Um, and then everything else will follow. So, so yeah, that, that, that's why my big push is on consistent methods and getting on with it um, and, and, and letting the accuracy bit improve over time. Yeah, that's why I'm so taken with what you've been doing around Part Z and the RICS uh, professional statement. And, you know, the, it's a very hot topic within Meckler without going into the detail of it. So um, um, there's, a, there's a lot of good minds applying themselves to, uh, to, to the issue of accuracy and, and, um, okay. and so forth. Um, Monica, you've probably been monitoring the, uh, the chat uh, um, very well. Is there anything from there that you'd like to particularly bring forward to, to a question for anybody just at this point? Um, obligation free offer but <laughs> I was trying to but uh, oops that's me <laughs> I mean I, I have a question around this uh, this uh, alliance contracting business um, which I'm intrigued because everything so much of what we talked about is vertical decision making vertical integration of teams um, and so much around procurement and contracting and adversarial world of, of, of construction um, mitigates against it um, I don't know if anybody's got a got a view on or signposts for where you know where we're seeing some good good um, outcomes in this space that that helps it. You know, obviously design construct with the way work Lynn Lee so often works helps, but it's not the whole whole territory. Anybody got any thoughts on that? I'm happy to jump in. I mean, I think certainly from Lynn Lee's perspective, the integrated model does help. Um, because you're able to connect in and get the and set the design brief and make sure that that flows through to construction delivery and you've got all parties talking from an early early stage um, but i think more and more too we're starting to turn our attention to how do we not just solve at a project and project to project but how do we solve for a, a portfolio of projects or a pipeline of projects um, so again how do we start to structure relationships in a way that we can start to have a longer term relationship with suppliers and be on a journey with them on a trajectory to zero um, rather than you know a, a short three four year we're going to buy this material review to install in our building and then we may tender it again and use you again next time sort of approach it's a, a different conversation different relationship yeah yeah i mean it's a it's a fascinating challenge i um it's such a shame that we certainly in Australia we moved away from the whole concept of um, integration and integrated project delivery and alliance contracting and all that kind of thing. But um, you guys have got control of your own world, so you're all right. Um, uh, learn from that without actually uh, necessarily entirely replicating the model. I think um, there was also a comment made, uh, and I, I I didn't quite catch who made it that neighbours are doing some um, you know good work in this space in terms of uh, trying to help us move towards a um, a coherent methodology. Um, I don't know if anybody's got any thoughts about whether we should just all hang fire and do nothing until a neighbour sorts it out or, or, or that's a parallel process that we should, um, worries me a bit that we put all the eggs in one basket, but uh, I don't know whether, you know, Lucy, you'd be prepared to venture an opinion on that, that putting you on the spot? Um, I think I think we're very excited about um, the work that Neighbours is doing and um, it's, it's balancing putting your eggs in one basket and and having that consistency and governance so i think that um it is it is the right it's the right approach in getting that consistency um but i think really um everyone's touched on it um that we can reduce sort of before before we report and while reporting is going to drive reductions um i think the industry uh the design the design teams we can start reducing uh we don't need a uh, like the solutions are out there it's it's about implementing them so mm. i think we can get on with it while while neighbors um comes with up with the goods and we know that measuring changes design culture straight away as soon as you get into the measuring measuring world um i know hudson wants to have a, a couple of minutes to wrap up so um and we did start a couple of minutes late so i i, I thanks everyone i i thoroughly enjoyed that i i reckon we actually did three hours work in one and a half hours um uh, and you know we we therefore did um, suffer from not necessarily being able to deal with all the potential questions that were lay between the points that people were making in the presentation. Great presentations, really enjoyed it. Uh, back to you, Hudson. Thank you, Ross, and thanks very much to our, our speakers. I should, you, to the point that there were, we covered a lot of ground, I should have mentioned up front on the topic of um, CPD points. Uh, 
This event qualifies for one CBD point from the GBCA for, for your attendance. Uh, please let the MECLA Secretariat know if you haven't already registered for this because we really have covered a lot of ground. Um, also noting the number of links that have been added to the, to the chat. So some resources for our ongoing thinking and um, yeah, special thanks um, to the, our, our UK correspondent, uh, Will Arnold um, joining us from um, the UK. I, I think that's added very much to the, to the depth of our discussion uh, and, and, and the breadth, just bringing in another jurisdiction and, and what they're doing, what we can learn from that part Z, uh, encouraging to hear that industry is taking the lead. I think uh, Meckla has set, stepped forward to, to take the lead and to, and to move uh, with government, but it's, it's great to hear that um, others are doing that around the world. So look, thank you very much. I know uh, a lot of work goes into the, the background of, of these talks and really appreciate um, the, the, the time from our, from our speakers. Um, on both sides of the Australian continent, we've had Western Australia, uh, Perth, Melbourne, Sydney, and, and of course, the other side of the world in, in the UK. Also a quick shout out to Rick Walters from um, Gresby, whose idea it was uh, originally that Meckler should host an event on the importance of design. So Rick, good on you, thank you very much. Thanks as always to my colleague, Monica Richter from WWF. Uh, her tireless work, strategic thinking, systems thinking just makes Meckler happen. So hats off to Monica. Thank you also to Carti Verheyen and uh, in absentia, Alexi Barnstone from Climate Kick Australia. Um, their organisation and communication skills, project management, keep us on track, keep everything working. So thank you. Finally, uh, a recording uh, will be uploaded onto the Meckler website and an email with the link will be sent to those who've registered. Um, so yeah, I, I think that I, I was taking slight uh, screenshots as, as we went because there were some great graphics there of, of timelines of, co of concepts and, and you know of some leading examples, whether it be Barangaroo or what Transport for New South Wales is up to. Our next Meckler event is a spotlight event on concrete and cement, and that'll be in mid-October. Um, and we will be releasing our paper from Working Group 2 on on the measurement frameworks that's been um, obliquely referenced a couple of times today. So um, that's that's coming forward. Um, and yeah, registration for the, the coming spotlight will be available on the Meckler website. You'll see it through our socials. Um, for now, thank you and goodbye.